Moana, thank you so, so much for joining the show this Monday and uh, you know, making time in your ISO life to join for a chat. <laughs> Well, it's definitely helped me feel some time, so I appreciate it. <laughs> I was just saying before that it's so lovely to have a reason to tell people stories of times from before any of this was even a blip on the radar and just get lost for an hour and just chatting about how you got here and, and everything that you've been able to achieve. So I'm really, really grateful um, to have you here because you're oh, thank you. It's just an incredible story. So I'm so excited. I've just been pouring <laughs> over this book for the second time around. Um, and I'm impressed as ever every time I read it. So first question before we get started is uh, mm. a bit of an icebreaker, which is just what the most down to earth thing is about you. And that's just because I guess in this digital age, it's so easy for there to be a really glossy social media surface or, or actual print media in your case surface and all the amazing things you've achieved. And um, you're so good at showing the real side of you and the family side of you. And obviously we've seen a lot of, a lot of Vinny and Belle and your wedding, but just to break the ice now for our listeners, what's something super normal about you or just daggy? Um, oh man, this one thing I do, which is people always love, but it's a thing that I do. So I work full time and on Saturdays, it's like my rest day. And the one thing I love doing the most, which I can't do right now, is I go to um, cinemas and I buy a large popcorn, a large frozen <laughs> coke and an ice cream and i bring it home with me and have it while i watch netflix but i love it and me leaving the movies of all this food and everyone looking at me is hilarious but um that's that's my thing that's what i love doing oh my god wait you mean <laughs> yeah. you go to the movies and you don't buy a ticket or watch it. a movie and you get your popcorn yeah. and you bring it home you know, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> yeah. It's like my favourite thing. I just love smashing popcorn um, whilst watching some Netflix or some TV and just I, zoning out. I actually think that's the best answer we've ever had on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm pretty normal. I think one of the biggest things about me, people, um, people, one of the biggest I guess misguided things people think of me is because I'm a female athlete. I have you know, I'm, I'm living in this giant mansion in which I own six houses, but people forget that I'm a female athlete, um, which means I'm paid less than a quarter of what the men get paid, which means I still pay, like, you know, pay my bills every week. I make sure that my rent check is just in on time. I'm just as normal as anyone else. Like, there's nothing I do that's extra to anyone else. Oh, well, I think that's part of why we all love you so much is your humility and the fact that you don't think it's anything extra. But I mean, the fact that you are a female athlete, um, but also are a full-time carer for Vinny, you're a wife, you also run a business that I think a lot of people haven't heard of the fact that you also have this business <laughs> on the side that's amazing and have yeah. to do so much ambassador and charity work as well. Like there's so many things that you do that I'm sure you think are just normal, but that aren't. Um, and your family story as well is something that I think I really, really loved reading about how often, you know, you think that everything is an overnight success or you think someone's had really smooth sailing because it looks really glossy and glamorous now. But to hear where you've come from and, and the journey it's taken you to get here is um, so inspiring. So I'm so excited to dive into that now. The, the first section is called Way TA, which is pretty much covering all the shit that came before the bit that most people walk into your chapter uh, to see. Yeah. So yeah. take us back to... It. Yeah, it's my favourite bit. It. <laughs> so let's go back to the very, very beginning. Young Moana yeah. in yeah. Lenroy with your 13 brothers and sisters, just a small <laughs> household. <laughs> Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, the thing that I loved most about, I think it was page three of your book, was that you never had any trouble being you. So even though yeah. you had a huge family, your beautiful parents made you all feel like it was safe to be exactly who you were. Uh, tell us about what you were like as a kid and what your childhood was like being one of so many siblings and... Um, and yeah, and finding who you were. I think I'll start by saying the most important thing, which is I am the best sibling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's no doubt about that. Obviously. Uh, yeah, 
I'm so proud of my upbringing. I think a, a lot of people tend to look at my upbringing and go, oh, pity, but I don't, there's none of that from me or my family. I think that we are very blessed to be able to have a roof over our head, clothes on our back and food on the table. And that's one thing mum worked really hard for. And, um, you know, growing up in Glenroy, mum still lives in the same house. She's been in there for about 40 something years. It's housing commission. Uh, it was two, be two bedroom most of my life growing up. Um, mum and dad had one bedroom. The rest of us had another bedroom. I think it was like, it was like five bunk beds and we're all head to toe. Um, <laughs> and that's how we slept. And then um, also my mum ended up, Eventually, my, unfortunately, my dad passed away as well when I was 12 to cancer. Mm -hmm. And then my mum had to work um, night shift. And we also had some of my nieces and nephews. She adopted some of my nieces and nephews. So it was about 19 of us kids living there at once. Oh, my gosh. Um, and she, would, she, would, she was a, a nurse at an um, old retirement house, a retirement building village. Um, and she would go at night time, work night shift, come home in the morning, get us up at five, six, we would have a whiteboard and we'd have all of our names down the whiteboard and everyone would have a job to do. So someone would be in charge of drying, someone in charge of washing. And then she would just get everything done with us. So in the morning before school, we would have breakfast, get ready, do house chores and prep dinner for that night, um, including lunches for school. And I remember we used to have like, for lunches for the day, it was about five loaves of bread. Um, and for dinner, we would prep, um, for one meal, we would peel 24 potatoes, like two bunches of silver beet. Like it was a lot of food we would prep, but we all had little jobs. And then we would go to school and then she would sleep. Um, and then we would come home and she would get up and we'd do it again. And, um, you know, we, like growing up, we never, I was never looked at or told that we were different or we were, you know, people from the outside would say poor or, you know, um, anything like that. We were just... We have love that you can't buy. And I think that that's more priceless than any amount of money you could ever have. Um, and so that's why we were always raised with just love. Like, you know, my dad used to train me at the Oval and used to make me play footy and, and train me and take me to my games. And when he could afford it, he'd buy me a new pair of footy boots. Um, you know, and, and my mum was, there was never a cap on my mum. Like if you told my mum you wanted to be an astronaut, she would go sweet, go be one. <laughs> you know, like we were just, yeah, just, pure love and um you know i think that was a reason why i guess that i'm the way that i am to mm. this day i loved that how much of the book was spent describing your childhood in just the most beautiful way and how you know i often say about raising children or starting a business or any kind of project that it takes a village but i'm sort of like you already had a village in your household to grow up with i'm sure you were never lonely <laughs> No, we we did, and we like we were um, we were typical little kids, to be honest. Like I have some of the funniest stories. Like I remember that because we never grew up having things like treats and chocolates and cakes and um, McDonald's or anything like that. We never had that kind of stuff, and we didn't need it either. But we, as kids, this is how crazy we were. I feel sorry for my mum. But we, <laughs> like, there was this place about three k's away from our house, and we used to call it the Donut Factory. But I only just figured out a little while ago, it was just a bakery. <laughs> it's where they're making <laughs> stuff. So they make all the donuts and bread and then they send it out to different bakeries. Um, but we, our whole life, called it Donut Factory. And it was just by chance we found it. So like, there used to be three or four of us that would cover for each other and would go down there at night time. They used to give us a free bag of donuts. I they remember just, this. I don't know, they just liked us. They would just give it. And that was like, I remember like those little stories. We would come home, we'd all share the donuts. Nobody tells mom, <laughs> go to bed. Like, you know, like we just did little things like that, that, um, you know, it was no harm to no one. But now I think back, I'm like, how beautiful were those people in the donut factory to be like, oh, those kids are back, get that bag of donuts. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it was just, it's always cute, fun, sweet stories like that. I also loved just the reminder that, you know, kids don't need a lot. They don't need to have a lot of things. They do need unconditional love and support and happy memories, but you can string together happy memories from very simple things like that, like a donut, like running away and, and having, um, yeah, simple things can be full of love. And uh, I love also hearing that you never felt deprived or you never even noticed that there was anything different until sort of older looking back. Um, I loved reading about your relationship with your dad and how he was such an inspiration to you in supporting you to play sport and not to consider yourself as a female athlete, but just to be an athlete and to like go out and beat 
the boys and, um, and you know, <laughs> um, tell us about, about him and, and also about what you thought you'd be like at the time when you were going into these sports, AFLW didn't exist. And um, I mean, female cricketers were very, very early on in the piece. So when you started, did you think that that was what you wanted to become or was that just something you did on the side? Yeah, like um, playing footy, like I, at first I was just watching my brothers and my, kicking the footy with my dad. I remember I kicked the first footy when I was about three. Like I was a tiny kid. So it wasn't until seven when I was allowed to start playing footy with the boys that I could play competitively. And I, I remember just playing footy, whether it's against the boys at the footy club or against my brothers in the backyard. Like it was always just about competition. It was never about a label. And that's the one thing I love about my childhood and uh, my childhood back then is when you're a kid, you're not exposed to, um, you know, you're not exposed to what people expect of you or what people think is normal. Or, mm -hmm. You know, so back then everyone's like, oh, when you're growing up, did the boys not like you playing? With them, I'm like the boys just see me as a person. They didn't see me as a boy. They didn't see me as a girl. Because when, you, when you're a kid, you don't think the way adults think, the way that they start getting trained to think, which is sometimes crazy. But growing up, they just were like, oh, she's not even she, just a footballer. Yes. It wasn't a girl football, it wasn't a boy football, it was just a footballer. And I didn't see myself any different to them. For me, it was just like, whether it's a boy or a girl, I'm going to take you on. Like, let's play footy. And I loved that growing up. Um, and that's the way it should be. So I think growing up my whole life, I always mimic myself as like a Jason Dunstall or a Matthew Lloyd or, yeah. you know, Shane Crawford. You know, unfortunately, there was no women in, in um, the TV back then. But at the same time, um, I didn't notice that as a kid. Like, it was just like, okay, I'm going to be him. That's who I'm going to be. And so in the backyard or the oval, that's who I'd mimic myself as with my brothers. And they would have their favourite players. So it was not weird. It wasn't different. It was just like, yeah, I'm probably going to play AFL one day. Oh, my God. I love that. Like, one thing I come back yeah. to all the time on this show is the fact that I called it Seize the Yay because yay is such a childish word. Like, it's so juvenile that almost a couple of people were like, are you sure you're going to stick with that name because it's so kiddy? And I was like, that's the point is that so many of us in this, like, roller coaster zigzaggy journey to figure out what we love and how, what's going to make us happy, you go back to when you were a child and you had no layers of expectation and the should and the um, all these, like, things that, the shiny things like money or success or objective things that other people impose on you, when you go back to when you were a child, most of the information is there. And then we just spend our whole adult life stripping all the shit back and then refinding who we were at the beginning. So I love that childhood mm -hmm. you was already there. You already had total equality and unburdened sense of the future. So beautiful. Yeah. And I love that too. And I think all kids should have that. And I think they definitely, you know, kids are not born sexist. Um, or mm. racist or anything like that mm. it's what they hear and what they're taught and what they're you know and that's when I have kids my kids are going to know nothing but love for everyone it doesn't matter and that's you know that's the one thing I love about Vinny that I always talk about when people ask me about Vinny is and I can prove this um, to anyone at any point if you brought in you know 10 different men from 10 different parts of the world different skin color different you know um, clothing, anything, and you asked them, asked her to explain to you what each man was, she would just say, a man. She would not say, you know, somebody from India, um, somebody from China, she would just say, it's the man. She doesn't yeah. see anything other than the person, and that's the way life should be. Yeah, having her around and her, even you know what, even, this sounds so silly, but even through her interactions with you on social media, her influence, I think she probably influences a lot more people than she knows. The way that she sees the world and the way that you then explain the way that she sees the world to us is actually the most sobering, like beautiful reminder of how simple things really are. Tell us a bit, for anyone who doesn't know about Vinny, Vinny is uh, five years younger than Mo and um, has Mebius syndrome, which is, is that how you say it, Mebius? That's exactly how you say it. Oh, yes. I was like, oh. <laughs> um, uh, mine is Vinny's full-time carer and uh, the syndrome usually affects your facial muscles but also can affect your developmental age. So Vinny's about six or seven. Is that the age that she's about? Now? Yeah, she, she would be, she, she's, you know, her age is um, five years younger than me. So I think she's like 26 or 27. She'll kill me for getting that wrong. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like 
you know, things we still do for her is like we still shell her, feed her. She's got, she's 24 seven care. She can't be left alone. Um, you know, since I've had her in the time I've had her, which is about five years, in that time altogether, I think I've been able to teach her how to go to the toilet by herself eventually, which, I, which has only just come through um, in the past two years. Um, and we're still just finishing off teaching her how to dress herself. So with someone with special needs, you can't just go, oh, okay, I taught you how to tie your shoelace, that ends. Like it's gotta be repetitive for years mm. and then it becomes a, a routine. Um, but yeah, I, the thing is when you say that, it's, it's so funny because people, adore her on social media like most <laughs> days when I, I'm, and I'm not joking like it's so funny because most days I reckon between five to 20 people will message me and go yes I love your story but we want Vinny <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm here for Vinny um I'm 90% here for Vinny Vinny. yeah that's the thing and I'm not, I'm not even mad about it because like you know that's I'm here for Vinny um and the thing is like I think People were always saying to me, can you get her an Instagram? And I'm like, no, because I will refuse to let someone ruin that perfect person. Yeah. Or, you know, she can't read or write. And people, people have social media bullied me and her yeah. in the way she looks and her disability. And she can't read and thank God for that. Mm. Um, but also, I love that she's just a clean cell. And nothing will ever change that, nothing. But I would not allow social media um to ever ever play a part on you know and I, like if i'm gonna be brutally honest i gave her an instagram a little while ago uh, a couple years ago and i checked it and some guy had sent her some really inappropriate photos so that was a time i capped it and locked it off and which she didn't go back there because she didn't understand what it meant she didn't yeah. get it she was confused yeah. and i don't get it and i'm confused and i'm bloody you know five years older than her so I just didn't want that kind of stuff coming to her when yeah. she doesn't understand it. And I would rather just keep her beautiful rawness um, shared through my social mm. so that people can just, you know, um, just get her the way I get her. I love that it's kind of like a family account. Like, <laughs> it's so cute. <laughs> it is. Like, I know. When people say I mentioned I'm not like, I'm not one of those people that need social media for followers. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm just not like, I don't count my followers or count people who unfollow me. I'm just like a, you know, it's a place I share my life. If you want to follow it, that's great. If not, mm. that's cool. Um, but the fact that Vinny can jump on and have an impact, like people, like I'm honestly probably going to, if I started counting the amount of people who told me that they started training because of Vinny, you'd be blown away. Probably not surprised, but blown away. People like Vinny have motivated women and mums and kids and, and men to get outside and walk and or exercise or you know try something and I think that that is that's a power that is, is a pretty beautiful thing. I always will remember the video that you posted of her when you like heard something downstairs in the middle of the night came downstairs and in the pitch black she's just chilling on the treadmill like yeah I'm doing my walking doing my walking yeah, like what just... oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly it like she did it again like three weeks ago as well because um she wanted to help me with work and she wanted to do a training in the morning and I got up because I want to get up about five six and I was like I didn't think she would get up and she was up and on it and I'm like what is going on <laughs> um, it, uh, like it's just just you know she actually walks on a treadmill for 80 minutes a day whoa yeah, oh God. Day, and she covers um, a thousand calories and she covers, I think it's between five to six, maybe sometimes seven K. Oh my gosh. Unbelievable. Like, oh my I, don't, I don't have the mental capacity to stand on something for 80 minutes. So she's doing really well. <laughs> what you do have the mental capacity for though, is like the, the thing about your story, even in trying to figure out what order I was going to ask you stuff about, I was like, there is so much in there. Like your book finishes <laughs> before pretty much before you even move to North Melbourne, really. I'm like, there's so much happening at all times. Like you're going to have like 85 <laughs> books for each chapter. Yeah. <laughs> but I think yeah. the thing that I love so much about you and that people love about you is that you have, you are really openly using your platform for good to, you know, when Vinny's school closed down to use that platform and awareness to bring light to issues you really care about and to show the sides of you that, 
you are kind of being like, here, here's what I'm doing. If you like it, follow. If you don't like it, don't follow. But you're using it to inspire up kids and other, you know, female footballers and male footballers. And I, I love how much that your platform is really dedicated to bringing people smiles and making them happy and inspiring them to do positive things. It's beautiful. Thank you. I think it's, I think that, and I was talking to Belle about this, I think since, I guess, getting somehow getting a, a crazy profile, um, I'm, I have been opened up to so much more of the world, so much more I've just never knew about, so many more politics I had no idea about. Mm. And, um, you know, when things happen at any school, if I didn't have a profile, nobody would know that the NDIS is shutting down special needs schools all over Australia. Nobody would know that. Nobody would know that mums have lost kids waiting for the NDIS to approve them. Like I had a mum whose daughter died waiting for help. Um, and that was one of many, like these stories are heartbreaking, but nobody will hear them because the NDIS is government rent. And, you know, as much as the government do good, they, they definitely don't help the people in need all the time and they, they need to do more. And I'm not afraid to, you know, when I was talking about mini school, somebody said to me, um, you're talking politics, aren't you worried you're going to lose your profile? I'm like, I don't have a profile. I don't want a profile. Like, I don't ask for a profile. I don't care about that stuff. I care about people. And, you know, I don't care about followers over what's right from wrong. So what, why should I care about... If people don't want to follow me because I have an opinion, then my unfollow button is on my social media. <laughs> and if people don't want to book me because um, they don't like to have an opinion... That's why I have a full-time job. I don't rely on that. Like, that's mm -hmm. not who I am. Who I am is a person um, uh, that grew up loving people and caring for people. And if I see people hurting who can't speak for themselves, 100% I'm going to do what I can to help them. Oh, my, you're a legend. So tell us <laughs> how that process did happen because it was quite a you know propulsion onto the scene as AFLW launched and, you know, you've gone from playing footy with your brothers to, you know, really making your way through local footy to VFLW and then to AFLW and the exhibition games and, and then to becoming like such a, a leading figure for women's football and women's sport and had a little bit of time where you walked away from the sport as well, you know, after your dad died and then have come back to it. Tell us everything that happened in that journey and also how you've managed to work full time and have your own company as well. <laughs> um, Giant yeah. question, but I'm like, you don't, I'll just let you tell, tell everything that, that comes out. <laughs> yeah, the funny thing is like when I tell people, when I do appearances or I do chats like this and I tell, tell people, people always like, oh, so what do you do during the day? I'm like, I, I work full time. Like I run a company. Like that's, that's what I do. That is my income. That's what pays the bills. Yeah. And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, like I've got 115 people that work for me every day. Um, and that's, that's my job. That's what I love doing. Um, and they just think, they, they just thought that I was paid enough to be an athlete, which mm which is every girl's dream. Um, but unfortunately, that's not how it is. And that's why I walked away from the game this year um, and stuck with work because, um, you know, it came down to the decision where if I stayed with footy, I had to quit my job. Yeah. And if I stayed with my job, I had to quit footy. And footy doesn't pay the bills. Like, you know, the highest paid female is like on $29,000. That is it. That's less than the payment you'd get from Centrelink. So um, that's not going to pay rent. That's not going to put food on the table and that's not going to take care of our family. So for me, it's of course I'm going to keep doing my job um, and I'll continue to make those decisions based on my family, not based on, you know, um, being out there and doing what other people think I should be doing. Like I'd love to play footy, but not at the, not at the expense of my family. Mm. Um, and that's why I made that decision. But I guess coming from playing locally, which is what I did my whole life, was play locally. Um, I remember I did take some time off and that was because um, that's when my mum first started finding out she started to, was getting sick and she still had all those kids living with her, like a lot of kids. Um, and when she told me that, I actually helped her out and I adopted two kids from her and um, took care of those kids and put them through school and um, was their carers for a couple of years um, just so I could give my mum that chop out. And... I just couldn't afford to go to play footy because 
uh, was looking after kids, little tiny kids, not big kids, little kids. So it was like they were in school and then I was back and I was working. So it was, I had a lot going on. And then when I came back, I came back because I've seen the first ever Western Bulldogs Melbourne exhibition game. Um, and I'll tell you the funny comparison of before and after professional football. But before I went away, like I remember playing state footy for Victoria and you would finish like you'd finish like the round robin for a week and then afterwards, you know, there was no such thing as recovery. There was no such thing as um, <laughs> ice baths or anything like that. Everyone would just like me with the bar. Like, you know, that was the thing. It was like celebrate at the bar. Um, and it's like don't, let's not forget that my entire life growing up, I paid fees, paid for my uniform, paid for the umpires. We all had to, we, the girls still do those things. Mm. Um, you know, when you play a national championship, you pay for your own flights and you pay for your own clothes. At the end of the championship, yep, you're going to celebrate. And I remember that when I first watched that Bulldogs Melbourne first ever game, I was like, wow, I want to do that. Like, I want to come back. So I just went straight to a um, uh, local footy team, got back on it, started playing. And then I was in the next game that they played the next year. And I remember because we played this game, which was the coolest thing ever, because I pulled on a Western Bulldogs jersey, which was like dreams come true. Um, and I remember the game finished. And I'm very shy. I'm super shy. Like, I remember that that whole game. I got I had the worst anxiety because I used normally get anxiety attacks. So I actually normally get, like, social anxiety, which is mm. bizarre. But I walked into... Um, after the game, I went back into the change rooms and I was like, Where's the, let's go get a beer. And everyone's like, <laughs> over here. Like, everyone's like, over here. And I'm like, okay, what's over here? And they're like, pointing at an ice bath. And I'm like, maybe the beer's in the ice bath. Yeah. I'm like, I'm going to get in it. Like, oh. <laughs> and I remember I get in and I was like, what is going on? What is this shit I paid? Like, this is insane. Um, so I had a very quick glimpse of what professional um, being a professional athlete was like and um, and then I kind of fell in love with that I fell in love with that process of taking care of your body and you can get more out of your game if you go to the gym and recovery and these are things we were never taught and we were never um, you know I was, I was never explained the benefits of and it was just always just play footy and that's it mm. so I guess going from you know local footy to that uh, was insane and then going to the Bulldogs exhibition game versus Melbourne where I kicked the five goals was crazy again because like um the crowd was just like this is like every time I was a kid and I would dream about kicking the winning goal and the crowd going nuts that's what it was like I was like I'm living my childhood dream right now um and then after the game I went back to my, my family's place and we're sitting there and somebody goes through somebody sent me a message and said Mo you're trending on Twitter and I'm like <laughs> What is Twitter? What am I doing on what? Like, what is Twitter? And why am I trending? Like, what is trending mean? Like, I just had no idea. Um, and then the next day, that like, was like front page, um, and oh, like the I was the big cover page of the of the of the Herald Sun, and like my mum's face of, of pure um, proudness, um, and a little bit of a tear from her mixed with. I'm, on, I'm in the paper and it's a pretty good photo. I'm pretty happy. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think it was, it was pretty amazing. And then to go from there to be signed with one of the biggest clubs in the land as Collingwood um, was just, you know, talk about, you know, dreams coming true. I know. I mean, I just love, like, I don't think it's that often actually that people actually get to live their childhood dreams, either because those dreams change or because, circumstances make it you know difficult to get there but you actually got to make it happen like what did that even feel like well I, I can't even like one of my favorite things about this like doing these interviews is when you watch someone start talking and their eyes start to sparkle because they're just so like <laughs> relive it like your eyes just then you're like I just I went out and I was like oh I just I love it so much seeing that you know even if you have been able to you know, have had or well, had to make the decision for family to walk away from footy that even in the career you did have, it made such a mark on you. And it was just this huge like circle of being a footy player since you were three to then actually walking out in the first AFLW season. Like amazing. What, what did, what did, yeah. What were the moments? What did it feel like? And what were the coolest moments in your memory that were just the most surreal or the most like, what is actually happening to me? Yeah, I think um, 
uh, like those moments I'm definitely going to share with my kids when they're old enough. Um, and I think that, I think that just, I guess, you know, when you're growing up and you say you talk to a family, like your brother or sister, and you're like, when I get older, I'm going to be an APA footballer. Or I'm going to be the prime minister. <laughs> yeah. And then you do something cool and you're like half five. And it was kind of like that moment. It's like, you relive for me it was like I relive those moments where I'd lay in bed with my football that I used to sleep with yeah. um and think about kicking that winning goal or you know winning that premiership or you know playing for an AFL club and that is quite literally what it was like for me but I think that um in regards to moments I think I think it was it's very public um all the moments on field but for me it was the moments off field, those moments off field, which I guess made me go, wow, this is much bigger than just a game. What this can do for people is bigger than, you know, it's bigger than me. And I think that, you know, that impact in itself is more important than any accolade that I, I could ever win. And I'll, I'll give you an example of a story. And I'm, I can promise you this is one of many stories but I had a mum message me on, on Instagram. and She just said, hey, thank you so much for replying to my daughter. Actually, it was Facebook, sorry. Replying to my daughter. And I'm like, no, no stress, because I try to reply to everyone that messages me, most, especially when it's kids. Um, and I was like, no stress at all. And then she sent me another message going, no, you don't understand what it means. And she sent me this whole message. And her daughter just sent me this random message. And it was something like... Um, um, you are my biggest idol and something else. And I was just like, you know, just stick at it, keep kicking goals, don't let anyone tell you that you can't. And um, and then her mum sent me this message and the message was about her daughter who had been bullied in school and then she tried to commit suicide and was unsuccessful. Oh, and then God. her mum had to leave work for a couple of weeks and just sit outside of her daughter's room to make sure she didn't do it again. And then her daughter being in her room found me on social media who then watched my clips on YouTube, who then felt like she belonged um, and she wasn't alone. And then that next day went back to school and has never turned back and is now playing footy. And her mum, for her mum to say, you saved my daughter's life, I don't think that that is true. But to know that I was able to have an impact on kids like that, you know, to make kids feel like, you know, that it's okay to be you and it's okay to be different. You don't need to be this... Um, figure that's thrown in your face all the time it's okay difference good difference beautiful and you know it's those kinds of impacts and it's those kinds of moments and just getting little photos of little girls kicking a foot in the backyard they're the things that is the impact that is much bigger than any accolade for me I love it so much and that since the very first time I've ever followed you or chatted to you has been so clear that the impact on others is, and the way that you can use this kind of random surprise influence um, for that purpose is, is so beautiful because I think that's the other thing about why I love these chats so much as well is that all anyone really needs is one touch point. There's only sometimes one conversation that changes everything for someone and they just need to hear it at the right time from the right person in the right context and you never know when that's going to be but if it comes at a moment like that for someone it can it can actually save their life or change the course of their life for the better and um it must just warm your heart so much to know that you've had that kind of impact on people. And I think you are such a strong role model for difference in a world where it's very hard when everything else is kind of forcing you to look the same or be the same or do the same. And yeah. Yeah. you stand out as someone who embraces difference and always has. And I love that about you. You know, you're half Maori, half German. You've, obviously <laughs> come out you're a footy player you're a carer like you, you don't do things by the book and I love that can you talk about yeah. for, for everyone else who's facing challenge and embracing their differences how you've developed that thick skin through you know being different and, and becoming okay with it and not caving to just kind of dulling those differences like I think a lot of people end up doing P.S. Whoever wrote that book of what you should be, I want to have a chat to them because um, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's definitely a one-way yeah. book. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think it absolutely comes from growing up in a family just full of love, full of people who do, not, who you know, don't judge anyone by any way and embrace and love everyone. Like I spent a couple of years going to an to an Aboriginal school. Um, as well and a lot of my really close family friends are Aboriginal so I've got to see you know um, 
some of their heritage and our neighbors um, were from Lebanon. I got to see their heritage. So like I've never seen anyone have gone, you're different or you're weird or you're odd or you, you know, you believe in a, in a different Bible or a different God. It's just kind of like, cool, like you do you. Like that's the way I was raised. But I think my thick skin came from, um, and this is the reason for the name of my book, My Way, was when I was, when I was 12 and my dad passed away, he, I remember because I, I used to go to every hospital appointment with him and um, I used to do everything with him. But at this particular time, he wouldn't let me be in his room when we're at home. He made me sit in the lounge room, but he was calling my older brothers and sisters in one by one. And all I could hear, like I can still hear the exact same tone and the exact same words over and over and over. And that was him just saying, man, I regret it. I regret it. I regret it. Mm. And it was all about regretful of not spending enough time with us and and not doing enough with us because he had worked um, he used to work night and mum worked day so he was always either at work or asleep it was a lot of regret um I think you know especially when you he knew he was going to die in like two days oh, and for me I kind of looked at that and was like never going to be that person like he's passed away now he's not coming back he doesn't get a ticket to come back he doesn't get to Skype me um, that's it. Once you, once you're gone, you are gone. So why come into this world and, and, and be someone that you're not like, why come here? Like why waste your life? That's the way I look at it. Why waste your life thinking, you know what? Sam says I should look like Mickey. So I'm going to look like Mickey. Like there's a reason why identical twins still ain't very identical. Like they're not actually identical. If you, you could tell them apart. Right. So we're all beautiful and unique in our own way. And I think the more people show that, the better, like the happier people will be because what's better than just being you? Like everyone is beautiful and I'm sick of seeing all of this crap about, you know, um, you have to look like this or you've got to be like this to be something. And, you know, it's all about followers and, and things like that. But that's not, that doesn't make the world go around. Like, look at the world right now with the coronavirus. Everyone's just out for themselves. Mm. Um, you know, it's not, that's not the end all. Like, you should be just happy and just be, um, uh, like, just be happy with you because um, we're all different for a reason. Embrace that. I think it's beautiful. I love that so much. I mean, even reading in the book about how you had faced so much challenge just even once you were in the AFLW in an environment where you would think diversity is highly appreciated because it's women's football for the first time ever, that, you know, hiding your tattoos or trying to be more butch or less butch or more feminine or less feminine, it's just kind of like, dude, there's so many layers of like just shit on shit on shit of like what you should be and what you shouldn't be and what fits into stereotypes and what doesn't. And it's hard in a world where we're getting far more progressive, but we also still lag in a lot of ways. And yeah, it's really hard to navigate, but I think that's wonderful advice. Yeah. I, like, I think that we, as much as we've gone moving forward, we're still so far backwards. I think that's, and that, that just needs to change. Like I think that's what I was, I was actually talking to my nephew and, um, and we're having this conversation because I'm trying to teach him what's right from wrong in life. And I said, I said, you know, if you've seen someone and you're not attracted to them, that does not make them ugly. Yeah, it just yeah. Means you're not attracted to them. That's yeah. It. And that's why I hate when people are talking about someone and like I don't surround myself with anyone that's negative. But if I hear someone talk about somebody that's ugly, I'm like, just because you're not attracted to him or her, it does not make him or her ugly. It just means you're not attracted to them. Um, they're beautiful, but just not beautiful for you. And I think that that's people need to get that right because if you don't find someone attractive, it doesn't make it doesn't mean you get to categorize them. It just means that it's not right for you. Absolutely. So when did you come out, and what was your journey in in that process? And I think you you and Belle have the most beautiful relationship and are helping really normalize I think gay marriage in a time where finally it's possible. Um, but I think a lot of people in the early stages of their journey still do face a lot of fear or um, pressure or there's just so many emotions in that it's still still stigmatised and still foreign to a lot of people. So 
yeah, how, how did you reach that decision? How did you guys meet? What has married life been like? And how, and obviously the fact that you got married and went on Survivor five days later has been a bit of a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll start with, I'll start, but like, you know, even with the book, um, people would message me and go, so in your book, I'm confused. Are you gay? Are you not gay? Are you coming out? I'm not coming out. <laughs> so, even, with, even with fully, I'm like, why do I have to come out? Like, why is that a thing? Yeah, like, I'm in yeah. love with a woman. It doesn't have to mean I have to come out. People don't have to come out. Like, oh, wait, so you didn't come me, out. You were just it out. Doesn't make me, I'm, I'm just gay. Like, I'm just in love with a woman. And, and people are always like, yeah, but are you going to come out to the public? I'm like, I don't. Like, and that's why my first public um, outing with Val was the brown line. Everyone's like, oh, she's got a girlfriend. I'm like, would you have been shocked if I rocked up with a boy? Like, why do I have to yell out to you that I'm gay? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Does, does somebody say to, um, you know, does somebody say to Bont and Pally boy love, you know, mm, are you out yet or are you straight? Does anyone, nobody says that to him mm. um, or any male player. Nobody says, are you out yet or are you straight? Which one is it? Yeah, like, yeah. Just confirm that you're straight you're now. Straight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So why are you doing that to me? Yeah, you know, um, when I fall in love, you will see who it is, and that's pretty much how it happened. And I wasn't falling into that, you know, I'm going to come out like I shouldn't have to. It's, it's you know, it's 2020 now, but and that's why my first outing was with Val and it was the brown low, and everyone was like, Whoa, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm out pretty. now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like I just think that that's so that's so old. Like it's so old that people have to come out. Like if you're in love with a man, awesome. If you're in love with a woman, awesome. Like just be happy. That's it. We just need more happiness in the world. Yeah. Um, So yeah. Um. That and then I guess meeting Val. Um. She like we met each other at uh, at a club. I was after the first ever AFLW season, and I was on a birthday, and she came. But she just come fresh back from India. She was living in India for a um, a couple of years doing modeling and she had not seen any AFLW and um, I'd had um, I'd been in the club and I decided at this point I'm single that's it I'm so single because I'd had some people trying to approach me for the wrong reasons and I was just like nah single life that's it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that's what I was yeah so I was at this uh, I was at a gay club and I was at a birthday and I, I was dancing and she came up to me and then she went to kiss me and I'm like not happening <laughs> and and then she, she went away and then um, she came back a little while later and she was very patient. I was like, I like this patient person. Like okay, now, now you brought me a drink. That's how we work around here. Um, and then, yeah, we kind of, we hooked up then. And then I guess from that point on, we were quite literally in, inseparable. Um, and then, yeah, and then we're going to fast forward three years and then we got married in um, August, um, which was um unbelievable it was pretty beautiful um and then i flew to survival four days later five days later <laughs> and then i found the next night spooning tarzan so i guess it's kind of like a honeymoon just without my honey slash spooning tarzan so it's kind of like you know you know works. just roll with it just roll with the punches <laughs> <laughs> i, I love- was happy that i'd spoon tarzan so i was like okay <laughs> I love that idea as well that, you know, people do really attach this significance to, to this idea that you have to come out and state your preferences in a particular way. And I think it's really refreshing to be like, I never did. I just am what I am. And then I fell in love yeah. with someone and then we just got married. But I do find it funny. I have a lot of gay friends who have this thing that like gay couples have a different time scale to everyone else. So like in lesbian <laughs> years, usually you would get married, you move in in like one month and then you get married like 11 months later. Like it all happens really <laughs> fast. So I feel like you guys, three years, you were really patient. Like you waited out. <laughs> you made sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, she did, she did ask me to marry her. I'm sure she would have probably asked me earlier. Oh my but, God, um, Belle asked you. How did she ask? How did she propose? Oh, it was, it was so beautiful. It was, um, again, everything that we've done has just been very us, which I love. It was just, um, what is she... She always hinted to me, I'm going to ask you to marry me. And I was like, yeah, ask my dad first. Like, I was always like, because, you know, you've got to ask you th- their dad. And um, um, she took that in a beautiful way. And 
She knows I'm a very chill person. I don't want no helicopter to the top of some high rise with with camels and flowers. That's not who I am. And it will <laughs> never be who I am. I love um, that. <laughs> and she got some of my favorite things. And she asked me at the cemetery at my dad's plaque. So he was there when she asked me. And she had my two best friends, my favorite bottle of champagne, my favorite cupcakes and rose petals everywhere. So that he was present. And I think that is something I'm going to remember forever. And it's more beautiful and meaningful and priceless than the whole helicopter um to the top of some building i think it's just more real and our whole relationship and and our wedding and and that engagement has just been very us like i was dressed in nike everyone knows i'm upset you you read it in my book like that's how i you you drew the swoosh any other way yeah so drew swooshes yeah yeah (laughs) oh man Becoming a Nike athlete after drawing swooshes onto your shoes as a kid must have just been like unreal, absolutely unreal. Oh, and and Vinny's I mean, like, Nike she, now. Oh yeah, she is. Like, but Vinny's the kind of person that she's just you can put her in anything and she'll be like, cool, I like it. Um, yeah, it is insane. And th- like my first time I went on Survivor, I actually I did it on both. I didn't mean to. Like, because I grew up being obsessed with Nike. Now I'm a Nike athlete and they send me shoes for free, right? Which is the craziest thing. <laughs> I, I am a hoarder. I save them all. No. Okay, so I, Al hates me, but I refuse to wear them. So when I want to survive oh, the no. first time, I know, when I want to survive the first time, you're allowed to take two pairs of shoes. So I took one pair, two pairs of runners, one pink Nike pair and one, and one um, trading pair. And I did not wear my pink pair because I didn't want to dirty them. Oh my God! <laughs> You're one of those. Yeah, yeah. and then oh. this one, this season, like halfway through when I voted Lockie out, you would have seen that really cool pink Nike long sleeve top. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to save it when I got home. So I was just like, nah, it's too nice. Like, oh my God, <laughs> you're a cutie. Like, that's the kind of person that I am. Because I'm like, I've never had it before. So I'm like, oh, these are beautiful. So, like I've got some limited edition, but they're just my everyday shoes. I just say, you know. Oh, I love that. I love that. It's just still so special. And like, I'm, I'm the same, like my family. So, you know, my mom, like my mom and my aunties are obsessed with you. I think because they also had like a similar upbringing in that they had big families and they didn't have much, but their parents made them think that what they had was exciting and Mm -hmm. their family is first and like material things that they're lovely, but they're not the be all and end all. And they, yeah, I, I love, I love that you, everything is so special. Like if I buy my mum something, I'm trying to like build her confidence and get her to wear, you know, really nice things. And she'll like literally not get them out of, out of the box and just like, I know I'm saving oh, them for a special day. <laughs> like my auntie. So guys, if you don't know, I've probably obviously not mentioned it before or cause I haven't had a reason to, but I've told Mo that my auntie, my mum's sister, who's like a second mum to me is obsessed with Moana, like obsessed. So I'm talking like, St Kilda Sharks, like VFLW, she was at the game, she'd go to training, she crossed the town to go to Mo's book signing. And this is her version of your shoes. She bought two copies of your book, one so you could sign and she could read it, and another so she could keep it pristine and not wreck it. <laughs> She's so sweet. That is so beautiful. It's so cute. And she's got like all your news. I showed you the newspaper clippings that she's got like of yeah, every yeah. time you've been in the paper. Cause she's like, she grew up a total tomboy, like cricket, tennis, footy, she's super sporty. But in her generation, you couldn't play sport as a woman. And so mm-hmm. you've just been like such a shining light for her. She's, yeah, she's so excited. Like fangirling, like she's... I've never seen a seven year old, 70 year old fangirl until she's my auntie too now i'm still on it oh yes please do oh my god literally once isolation's finished she'll literally be on your doorstep like <laughs> she's more than welcome come have a matcha she can come have a matcha oh yeah <laughs> so before we move to the last section just quickly uh i'm sure most of the listeners have been following on the survivor so there's plenty of time for them to catch up on what happened but just now that you know it's all the results are out how are you feeling now and how how have you you know reflected on the time there have you had any revelations is it amazing to be back with the fam like the reunion when Vinny and Belle ran out I was just like I'm dying I'm dying it was so sweet yeah we were crying too and we were there so (laughs) um (laughs) 
it was like I like the thing is, and I've done a few interviews based around Survivor and my exit, and I don't like that is me who that's who I am that you've seen on the show. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't go in and play a character or go on the show for the wrong reasons or anything like that. Like I truly just wanted to go on the show and try and win. Um, like I don't even know how many zeros are in a half a million dollars. So imagine winning that. <laughs> Um, so for me, it was more, it was, it was, I was there for the real reason and I was to win, um, but I didn't. But at the same time, I'm totally not upset about it. Like, you know, I wish I had a one, but at the same time, I know money doesn't make the world go around. Mm. Um, and I know I could have done some amazing things with that, but still life is good. Like I am healthy. Um, I have a roof over my head and food on the table. And I think for me, those things are my life qualities that I've had forever and they're the things I cherish the most. So. Um, I absolutely loved it. I think people were always like, oh, what about your edit? And like, you know, we'll film 24 seven, like every second of the day we'll filmed. They can't show everything and that's okay. Like, and I love all the production. They all did an amazing job. Um, and, you know, Dave and Sean are two amazing players. And what's better than to have three quality plays at the end rather than, you know, somebody that's kind of laid under the radar the whole time. So for me, it's like, I got third. My mum was proud of me. My family loved it. Um, Belle uh, was just super stoked. I got to the end and Vinny still hates me for voting out Tarzan. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, oh I'm pretty goodness. happy with where it got to. Like, to be honest, I'm pretty happy. Sweet. Like, yeah. I think that's so good. I mean, you did such an incredible job and it, like what an experience to make it all the way to the top three anyway is like huge and that people get to know you a little bit better because you didn't get to stay as long as you wanted to on the first time. And Yeah, I think it, it was a beautiful way to share some of yourself with the nation and like as anyone listening will know, we all love you. This is just, you're just such a down to earth, inspiring and resilient person. It's really lovely yeah. to Thank have been you. chatting. So the last section before we wrap up is called play TA, which is pretty much separating everything about who you are when you're being productive or doing your job or working. I think we all get really wrapped up in this like productivity hamster wheel where we're doing what we should and we're going after goals and things like money or success. And um, it sounds like you've got already such a good head on your shoulders about like the little joys in life, (laughs) but yeah. When you're having downtime, like for example, during isolation, when you're forced to be at home, what are the little things that you do for just your joy? Like tactile things that aren't on your devices? Is it footy? Is it like board games? Do you watch Netflix? Like what are your things that you do to play? Um, I've got like a little home gym set up. Um, So I get so much out of working out. Like I don't want to sound lame because working out's not the end all be all, but I the endorphins I get from working out just gets my day going. So I love this. I've got I I brought this is not a plug. I didn't I don't get given things for free, but I bought myself something called the Wahoo Kicker, and you connect it to your bike, and then what you can do is you ride and you're in a screen and you've got your own bike in the screen and as you ride it rides and you can ride in real in real time with people so oh my for example, gosh Maddie rogers, i don't know so for example Maddie rogers in queensland so i'll be on the screen and there's people all over the world riding and they're just riding you ride any tracks you can ride in new york in london anywhere you want um and you do any program you want and then you can do catch up with friends so he can jump on i can jump on and we can ride and his emoji is riding beside my emoji and the faster I go, he has to catch up vice versa. Oh my God, that's so cool. It's, uh, it's so, it's unbelievable. So it's like, I can train with anyone, but in real time, like, and it's all, you know, done very specifically. Um, and it's very cool. And I've just got Vinny on the same thing, but on a walking version. <gasps> oh my God. So she can, I know, so she can walk in this game it's not a game it's real like it's real life like you're actually it measures your every step from the thing that goes on your shoe to every step she's walking through and people can walk with her or she can walk alone or she can just walk and overtake people oh my god that is so Um, cool yeah like i just like i think because i have this little crazy thing for technology like i love technology like one of my favorite things in the world oh my god when i found this bike thing from maddie because i got it from maddie rogers i was like oh my god i need that and now that isolation's in um, I enjoy that and taking the dogs for walk. Oh, and that's cute. I'm not, yeah, I'm not afraid to say a little bit of Netflix. Yeah, what do you watch? I'm so intrigued by what people choose to watch. 
Oh man, we just watched this one. Oh, what's it called? I really want to tell you what. We're done. Oh, we watched two. One's called Pandemic. Have you heard oh, that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting time to I watch that. It. I watched the trailer and then I was like, ooh. Here's the thing. This was filmed. Okay. <laughs> Is that Belle? This was, yeah. I'll send her <laughs> my love. Hi, Belle. Yeah, I'll tell her. Um, that that um, show was filmed before the coronavirus comes out and in it, this documentary, in it, they talk about the freaking coronavirus. What? What? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. And they're testing bats for coronavirus and... Um, Shut up. Yeah, it's, it was a thing before it was a thing. Watch it. I watched it and we were just like, what the hell? Like, oh they actually God. talk about the coronavirus they're trying to prevent. And, you know, trying to get government grants to help them get a cure and stuff before it comes out Jeez. or something to prevent it, like a flu shot. Whoa. Watch it. It's very cool. And the other one is um, Unorthodox. Have you heard of that uh, one? Nah. Is it a doco as well? Oh are, you, are you a doco well, girls? It, we are, but this is actually a TV series, but it's based on a Ooh. true life story. It's actually, like, taken over that Tiger King crap. Um, <laughs> You know what I don't get is this Tiger King thing. Everyone's talking about, yes, she did kill her husband, first of all. Second of all, yes, he is an idiot. All of them are. Third of all, the thing I hate that nobody's talking about is what about these poor tigers? Oh, absolutely. I'm like, why is no one rescuing them? <laughs> exactly. That's what me and Belle were saying. Belle put a story up the other day. I'm like, 100% agree. Why aren't we talking about saving the tigers that are getting shot? and buried just so they can get the babies so people can make money and then Netflix make this documentary to make money and still nobody's saving these poor bloody tigers. <laughs> oh my god I literally <laughs> it took me like a week to realize what all these tiger memes were coming out I was like am I old like do I just not understand what's going on? <laughs> 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 oh man well last two questions to finish up firstly what are the three <laughs> interesting things about you that don't normally come up in conversation? Which I feel like you've shared a lot of them, uh, but uh, you've got to find three more. Interesting thing. Can I ask Belle? I yeah. Oh, my God. That's even better if she answers for you. I love it when couples answer for each Belle? other. Belle, what's three interesting things about me that nobody knows? <laughs> like weird habits or funny things you do. Come here, Belle. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like quirky, something quirky. Yeah, I already said I'm addicted to technology. Hello, beautiful. Hi, I'm so oh my God. She's not she's not dressed for camera. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my brother and sister just bought a house. Okay. Um, three interesting things that nobody knows about you. Everybody knows everything about you. Nothing quirky. Um, I feel like there's definitely some you know, wifey, quirky things that you can dish up? Like, does she do any weird snoring or like, are you good at cooking <laughs> anything sleeps, in particular? She sleeps quite a bit. Ooh. Oh, I, I did have something quirky happen from Survivor. I'll tell you about that. She loves Ooh, it. spill. I, I am, um, on, like I sleep naked normally. Um, so when I came back, I had the worst PTSD and still happens. So I'd be asleep in bed with Belle and, and during the night I'd be, wake up and I'd think I'm on the island and I'd go, shit, I'm naked, there's cameras. <laughs> so I'd just wake up and get head to toe dressed and then get back into bed and I'm like, okay, I'm okay now. So I'll wake up fully clothed. Oh my God. And you just be like, how did this happen? What even? Yeah, PTSD. Oh yeah. man. That's a good one. I think something else people don't know about me is I do. I love animals. I'm obsessed with animals and I, I don't support anybody that hurts animals or yeah. Tiger King. I feel like you should make a, a whole TV show now about rescuing the tigers. That could be your new thing. Seriously, yeah. I can't believe that that's not the main message that came about after that. Like, I was horrified. I know. I don't even understand. <laughs> like, I'm so confused why there's not a whole movement. Yeah. And she totally killed her husband. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I watched the trailer and I knew that. I was like, yeah, I'm 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 sure. Yeah. I mean I watch a lot of yeah, crime yeah. shows, I know the answer. Bloody Carol <laughs> King. Right. <laughs> and very last question, since I love quotes so much, what's your favorite quote? Um well, what a, um mine is just live with no regrets, because that goes back to my way, which goes back to always be you. Oh, that's 
That's so good. I love that you don't waver from it. It's beautiful. Yeah, no, that's just it. Oh. That's mine. Thank you so, so much for joining. This was such an amazing chat. Belle, thank you so much for the cameo. It was amazing <laughs> to chat. Okay, I'm <laughs> the other Netflix show we yeah, watched. It was so good. Oh my god, that's what I'm gonna disappear and do for the rest of my afternoon now. I'm so excited. There's only, just... there's only four episodes and oh, it's so good. I hate shows that only have four episodes. <laughs> I consume <laughs> TV so much. I'm like, what? I'll finish four episodes in like by today. Yeah, we did. We did <laughs> <laughs> So I can see how you guys are spending ISO then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right guys. i think someone tried to come in before by the way yeah someone definitely tried to come in before i heard it and i was like did they were they, who was that was it my dog was it the retriever <laughs> do you see who no, it was it was, a, it was a person they came in twice and walked back oh my god really was it nick it was probably nick. <laughs> I, hope, I hope someone should be there like oh my god there, imagine <laughs> imagine if i was like no nah, i'm home alone Oh, fuck. oh that would, I'd be like, I'm um, getting out. <laughs> oh my God. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining. This was such a good chat. And always just thank you for being such an open book and, and so inspiring with your honesty and, um, and rawness and yeah, just being you. Oh, anytime. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'll send my auntie over and you guys can have a good chat. Yeah. <laughs> and let me know where to drop that jumper off to. Oh, I will. Oh my God, I will. That would be awesome. I'll just, I'll shoot you a message. All right, that sounds All good. All right, you take care. bye. Thanks so much, love. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.